Welcome to Open Books, the most cozy corner of the world. Before we dive into our enchanting bedtime story, don't forget to grab your favorite blanket, find that perfect comfy spot. So, get ready to unwind, relax, and let the magic of storytelling guide you into a world of dreams. Chapter 1 Down the Rabbit Hole Alice found herself growing increasingly weary of sitting alongside her sister by the riverbank. The lack of activity and the absence of any captivating content in her sister's book left Alice in a state of restlessness. The book, void of both pictures and conversations, seemed utterly pointless to Alice. Contemplating her options on that hot, drowsy day, she wondered whether the joy of crafting a daisy chain justified the effort of rising and gathering daisies. Suddenly, a white rabbit with pink eyes darted past Alice. While not particularly extraordinary, Alice paid little heed to the rabbit's passing until she overheard it muttering about being late. Reflecting on the incident later, Alice realized she should have found it peculiar, but in the moment, everything seemed oddly ordinary. To her surprise, the rabbit pulled out a watch from its waistcoat pocket and hurried away. This unexpected sight prompted Alice to spring to her feet, her curiosity ablaze. She chased the rabbit across a field and witnessed it vanish down a large rabbit hole beneath a hedge. Without a second thought, Alice followed suit, not considering the logistics of getting back out. The rabbit hole resembled a tunnel, and Alice descended for what seemed like a considerable distance. As she fell, she had ample time to observe her surroundings a dark well with cupboards and bookshelves lining its walls. Maps and pictures hung from pegs, and Alice even attempted to interact with a jar labeled orange marmalade, only to find it empty. As the fall continued, Alice pondered the miles she might have descended, recollecting lessons from her school days. Eventually, she vocalized her musings about reaching the Earth's center and speculated on the potential antipodes she might encounter. Unbeknownst to her, Alice's words were unheard, and the fall persisted. In her descent, Alice contemplated the strangeness of asking about her location, considering whether she had landed in New Zealand or Australia. Sleepiness began to overtake her, and she entered a dreamy state, questioning the dietary habits of cats and bats. Abruptly, Alice landed on a heap of sticks and leaves, unharmed but surrounded by darkness. Undeterred, she rose and noticed another passage with the white rabbit still visible. Urgency fueled her pursuit leading her into a long, dimly lit hall with locked doors. As Alice explored, she stumbled upon a three-legged glass table holding a tiny golden key. Despite her hopes, the key failed to open any of the hall's doors. However, on a subsequent attempt, Alice discovered a small door behind a low curtain. The golden key unlocked this door, revealing a passage leading to a beautiful garden, a sight that left Alice yearning to escape the dark hall and explore the vibrant outdoors. Regrettably, the door was too small for Alice to pass through. Frustrated, she wished to shrink like a telescope, contemplating the seemingly impossible in a world where extraordinary occurrences had become the norm. Returning to the glass table, Alice found a bottle labeled a drink me and a paper label proclaiming its contents as a delightful mixture. 
Cautious of potential poison, Alice initially hesitated but succumbed to curiosity and tasted the liquid. To her delight, it was a pleasant concoction of various flavors, and she soon found herself shrinking. As she diminished in size, Alice's excitement grew, realizing she was now the perfect size to enter the garden through the small door. However, she wisely waited to ensure she wouldn't shrink further. Pondering the consequences of excessive shrinking, Alice finally entered the garden, leaving the dark hall behind. Chapter 2 The Pool of Tears Curiouser and curiouser, exclaimed Alice as she marveled at her ever-changing circumstances. The surprise left her momentarily speechless, forgetting how to speak proper English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. Alice declared, realizing that her feet were nearly out of sight, growing distant as she continued shrinking. Concerned for her tiny feet, Alice pondered who would put on their shoes and stockings. She contemplated being kind to them, fearing they might not walk the way she wanted. Lost in her thoughts, Alice planned to gift them new boots every Christmas, forming a whimsical plan to ensure their well-being. As Alice grew to over nine feet high, she hurriedly took the little golden key and rushed back to the garden door. However, to her dismay, the door remained shut, and her shrinking size made entering more impossible than before. Disheartened, Alice sat down and burst into tears. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. A great girl like you, scolded Alice, attempting to halt her tears. Despite her own admonishments, Alice continued crying, creating a pool around her, about four inches deep and extending halfway down the hall. Amidst her tears, Alice heard a pattering of feet in the distance. Quickly drying her eyes, she saw the white rabbit returning adorned in splendid attire. Panicking, the rabbit muttered about the duchess and hurriedly disappeared into the darkness, leaving Alice with the fan and gloves. Fanning herself to combat the hall's heat, Alice remarked on the peculiarities of the day and questioned whether she had been changed overnight. Attempting to recite a familiar poem, she found her voice hoarse and the words distorted. Feeling uncertain about her identity, Alice pondered the great puzzle of who she truly was. Desiring answers, Alice began considering children of her age, hoping to find clues about her altered self. In her contemplation, she dismissed the possibilities of being Ada or Mabel. However, the confusion deepened, and Alice lamented the idea of living in a pokey little house, with toys and numerous lessons. Despite her resolve to stay in Wonderland, Alice suddenly burst into tears, expressing her exhaustion and loneliness. Gazing at her hands, she was surprised to find herself wearing one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves. Worried about shrinking again, she measured herself and realized she was now about two feet high, rapidly shrinking further. Understanding that the fan was causing her shrinking, Alice dropped it just in time to avoid disappearing entirely. Grateful for the narrow escape, Alice declared her determination to reach the garden. However, Upon reaching the little door, she discovered it closed again, and the golden key lay on the glass table. Distressed, Alice thought, things are worse than ever. 
She lamented her small size and wished she hadn't cried so much. Filled with regret, she anticipated punishment, wondering if she would be drowned in her own tears. Suddenly, Alice found herself in a pool of tears, realizing she had wept enough to create this saline pool. Considering the possibility of going back by railway, she recalled her seaside experience, with bathing machines, children digging in the sand, and a row of lodging houses. To her relief, Alice realized she was in the pool of tears, not the sea. She swam, hoping to find her way out, but soon heard splashing nearby. Investigating, she discovered a mouse, and hopeful that it might speak English, she addressed it politely, seeking directions out of the pool. The mouse, however, did not respond, prompting Alice to try speaking French. Startled, the mouse leaped out of the water in fright. Apologizing for her unintentional offense, Alice attempted to change the topic by asking if the mouse liked dogs. The mouse remained silent, and Alice eagerly described a little terrier, hoping to engage its interest. As Alice spoke, the mouse showed signs of agitation and swam away, creating a disturbance in the pool. Undeterred, Alice called after it promising not to talk about cats or dogs anymore. The mouse reluctantly returned, its face pale with passion, and agreed to share its history on the shore. With the pool growing crowded with various creatures that had fallen into it, including a duck, a dodo, a lorry, and an eaglet, Alice led the way as the entire party swam to the shore. Chapter 3 A Caucus Race and a Long Tail The peculiar group gathered on the river bank presented a rather bedraggled sight, with birds sporting draggled feathers and animals whose fur clung closely to them, all dripping wet and cross. The immediate concern was how to get dry again, leading to a consultation among the curious assembly. Surprisingly, Alice found herself engaging in familiar conversation with them, as if she had known them all her life. In the midst of the discussion, Alice had a prolonged argument with the lorry, who stubbornly claimed seniority without disclosing its age. Frustrated, Alice couldn't determine whether it was an elder statesman or a mere pretender. The mouse, assuming an authoritative role, intervened, instructing everyone to sit down and listen attentively, promising to expedite the drying process. As they formed a large ring with the mouse in the center, Alice anxiously watched, fearing she might catch a cold if not dried promptly. The mouse, adopting an air of importance, declared, Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. With that, it began reciting a historical account that seemed to baffle some of the creatures, like the lorry, which shivered in discomfort. The story, a mixture of William the Conqueror and various earls, brought forth a chilly atmosphere. The lorry interjected with a puzzled, Ugh prompting the mouse to reprimand it for the interruption. The tale continued, recounting the events with William's moderate conduct and the subsequent insolence of his Normans. Amidst the narrative, the group realized that Alice remained as wet as ever. The dodo, taking charge, proposed a caucus race as the ideal remedy. However, the eaglet objected, demanding simpler language, and the dodo explained the peculiar race that involved running freely until everyone was dry. Once completed, the dodo declared the race over, 
leaving everyone puzzled about the winner. The confusion led to the distribution of prizes, and Alice, uncertain of the proceedings, managed to produce a box of comfits from her pocket. In the end, each participant received a single comfit as a prize. The dodo, serious as ever, then suggested that Alice herself deserved a prize, and, searching her pocket once more, she produced a thimble for herself. Amidst the comfort-eating session, the mouse resumed its tale, a long and sad tale that involved a legal dispute between Fury and a mouse, complete with a mock trial. Alice, momentarily distracted and lost in her own thoughts, apologized, and the mouse, clearly irked, continued the story. When the mouse abruptly stood up and walked away, Alice implored it to return and finish the story. The creatures, too, joined in the plea. However, the mouse remained indifferent, leaving the group disappointed. The lorry expressed regret at its departure while an old crab seized the moment to impart a lesson about maintaining one's temper. Left alone, Alice spoke aloud, expressing her longing for her cat, Dinah. The mere mention of Dinah caused a commotion, with some birds hastily departing and others offering various excuses to leave. Feeling increasingly desolate, Alice couldn't help but shed a few tears, wondering if she would ever see her beloved cat again. In the midst of her melancholy, Alice perked up at the sound of approaching footsteps, hoping against hope that the mouse had reconsidered and was returning to continue its story. Just as Alice eagerly anticipated the mouse's return, she heard a faint pattering of footsteps drawing near. Turning her attention to the source, she hoped to see the mouse rejoining the group. As the footsteps approached, the mouse's figure came into view, and Alice couldn't help but address it once more. Please come back and finish your story, Alice called out, her plea echoing across the deserted landscape. The other creatures also chimed in, urging the mouse to continue its narrative. However, the mouse remained indifferent to their entreaties, maintaining its brisk pace and seemingly unwilling to be swayed. Frustration and disappointment filled the air as the mouse distanced itself from the group, leaving Alice once again in a state of uncertainty. The peculiar assembly, now diminished in numbers, stood in silent anticipation, hoping for the continuation of the mouse's long and sad tale. Chapter 4 The Rabbit Sends in a Little Bill As Alice continued her journey, she encountered the familiar figure of the white rabbit. The rabbit, trotting slowly and looking anxious, seemed to have lost something. Alice overheard its mutterings about the Duchess, expressing concern about potential execution. The rabbit mentioned misplaced items, the fan and a pair of white kid gloves. Alice quickly deduced that the rabbit was searching for these items. In a good-natured manner, Alice volunteered to help locate the lost possessions. However, her search proved futile, as everything around her appeared to have changed since her swim in the pool. The great hall with the glass table and the little door had vanished entirely. The rabbit eventually noticed Alice and angrily mistook her for someone named Mary Ann, instructing her to run home and fetch a pair of gloves and a fan. Frightened, Alice obeyed without correcting the rabbit's mistake, pondering the amusing surprise he would experience upon discovering her true identity. Following the rabbit's instructions, 
Alice arrived at a neat little house with a brass plate reading, W. Rabbit. Ignoring formalities, she entered and hurried upstairs, fearing she might encounter the real Mary Ann. Inside a tidy room, she found a fan, several pairs of tiny white kid gloves, and a mysterious bottle near the looking glass. The bottle lacked a drink me label, but Alice uncorked it and took a sip, anticipating an interesting consequence. As expected, the liquid caused her to shrink rapidly. Concerned about her diminishing size, Alice hoped the shrinking would stop soon. Unfortunately, it didn't, and she found herself too small to exit the room through the door. In desperation, Alice tried various positions, including kneeling, lying down, and even extending an arm out of the window. Eventually, she resigned herself to the situation, wondering about her fate. Fortunately, the magical effects of the bottle ceased, leaving Alice small but no longer shrinking. Despite feeling uncomfortable, Alice recognized her predicament and acknowledged the need to find a solution. Meanwhile, the commotion caused by her earlier encounter with the rabbit continued outside. The rabbit's cries and the voices of other creatures became audible as they discussed various plans to address the situation. Alice waited anxiously, hearing snippets of conversation, including the decision to burn down the house. Determined to prevent this, Alice shouted a threat involving her cat Dinah. The threat led to a sudden silence, and Alice wondered about the creature's next move. After a while, the scene outside evolved into discussions about ladders, broken glass, and efforts to rescue the rabbit named Bill. Alice observed the chaos through the window contemplating the absurdity of the situation. As the confusion continued, Alice's attention shifted to the transformation of pebbles into little cakes. She realized that eating one might reverse her shrinking, so she consumed a cake and experienced a delightful return to her normal size. Seizing the opportunity, Alice fled the house, leaving behind the bewildered creatures. Outside, a crowd of animals and birds awaited her. Despite the relief of escaping the chaos, Alice recognized the need to return to her right size and find her way to the lovely garden she had heard about. The journey continued with Alice contemplating her next steps in the unfamiliar wonderland. Chapter 5 A Device from a Caterpillar In the peculiar wonderland, Alice found herself facing the caterpillar. For a while, they stared at each other in silence. Eventually, the caterpillar removed the hookah from its mouth and spoke in a languid, sleepy voice, posing the question, Who are you? This opening was not particularly encouraging for a conversation. Alice, feeling shy, replied, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. The caterpillar, adopting a stern tone, demanded an explanation. Alice, unable to provide a clear one, expressed her confusion about her changing sizes throughout the day. The caterpillar dismissed her confusion, asserting that it wasn't confusing at all. Alice, however, insisted that being various sizes in a single day was indeed perplexing. The caterpillar, seeming uninterested, questioned her identity with a tone of contempt, 
bringing them back to the beginning of their conversation. Irritated by the caterpillar's curt remarks, Alice gravely suggested that it should reveal its identity first. The caterpillar responded with another puzzling question, asking, why? Unable to find a good reason, and sensing the caterpillar's unpleasant mood, Alice turned away. The caterpillar called her back, claiming to have something important to say. Alice returned, and the caterpillar advised her to keep her temper. This led to a brief exchange where Alice asked if that was all, and the caterpillar confirmed it. Alice decided to wait patiently, hoping the caterpillar might share valuable information. After a few minutes of puffing on the hookah without speaking, the caterpillar unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth, and addressed Alice again. It inquired whether she believed she had changed, and Alice confirmed her fear of not remembering things and constantly changing sizes. The caterpillar challenged Alice to recite verses, leading her to share lines that deviated from the intended poem. The caterpillar, unsatisfied, asked her to recite, You are old, Father William. Alice complied, reciting a comical version that amused the caterpillar. As the conversation continued, the caterpillar questioned Alice about the size she desired. Alice expressed a desire to be a little larger, and the caterpillar angrily insisted that her current height of three inches was excellent. Despite Alice's pleas, the caterpillar resumed smoking the hookah. In a moment, the caterpillar climbed down from the mushroom and disappeared into the grass, leaving Alice alone. Before vanishing, it cryptically mentioned that one side would make her grow taller, and the other side would make her grow shorter, referring to the mushroom. Curious about the mushroom's effects, Alice contemplated which side to try. She eventually broke off bits from both sides and experimented with eating them. The results were swift and unexpected, a violent blow under her chin sent her shrinking, and soon her shoulders vanished, leaving only a long neck. Confused and alarmed, Alice found herself with a neck that could bend in any direction. She encountered a pigeon, which mistook her for a serpent and complained about the troubles of dealing with serpents. Alice tried to explain but was met with skepticism. Alice, now at her usual height, decided to continue her journey and soon stumbled upon an open space with a small house. Aware that her current size might frighten any inhabitants, she nibbled on the mushroom to adjust her height to a more acceptable nine inches. Chapter 6 Pig and Pepper For a brief moment, she gazed at the peculiar house, contemplating her next move. Abruptly, a footman in a smart livery emerged from the woods, prompting her to identify him as such based on his attire. However, had she solely focused on his face, she might have mistaken him for a fish. With a loud rap of his knuckles, he summoned another footman, similarly attired, whose round face and large eyes resembled those of a frog. Both footmen, Alice observed, sported powdered hair, forming elaborate curls on their heads. Intrigued by the scene unfolding, Alice discreetly approached, eager to eavesdrop. The fish footman presented a colossal letter, almost as large as himself, from beneath his arm, handing it solemnly to the frog footman, who, in turn, 
declared in a grave tone that it was an invitation from the queen for the duchess to partake in a game of croquet. The ritual repeated, with only a slight rearrangement of words. As they bowed low, their curls entwined, provoking laughter from Alice, who quickly retreated into the woods to stifle her amusement. Upon her return, the fish footman had vanished, leaving the other seated on the ground near the door, gazing vacantly into the sky. Alice timidly knocked, to which the footman dismissively replied that there was no point, citing his proximity and the uproar within. Curious about the commotion, Alice strained to hear a cacophony of howls, sneezes, and occasional crashes emanating from the house. Undeterred, Alice asked how she could gain entry. The footman nonchalantly stated he would remain seated until the next day. Suddenly, the house door swung open, and a large plate hurtled out, narrowly missing the footman's head before shattering against a tree. Ignoring the incident, the footman continued in the same tone, suggesting Alice might have better luck the next day. Frustrated, she demanded entrance, but the footman retorted with the question of whether she was to get in at all. Disturbed by the irrational conversation, Alice decided to enter on her own, finding herself in a smoke-filled kitchen. Seated on a three-legged stool in the midst of the chaos was the Duchess, cradling a baby. The cook, tending to a cauldron of overly peppery soup and a large cat on the hearth, grinning widely, were the only things unaffected by the constant sneezing. Alice hesitantly inquired about the cat's grin, prompting the Duchess to attribute it to the Cheshire cat, explaining it was a grinning cat. In a sudden burst, she exclaimed, Pig, directing the word at the baby rather than Alice, who, relieved, continued her inquiry. I didn't realize that Cheshire cats always wore grins, actually. I didn't know they were capable of grinning at all. All of them can, asserted the Duchess, and most of them do. Personally, I don't know any that do, Alice replied politely, pleased to engage in conversation. You don't know much, the Duchess retorted bluntly, a remark Alice found disconcerting. Deciding to shift the subject, Alice struggled to select a suitable topic when the cook, with a sudden burst of energy, removed the cauldron from the fire and began hurling various items within reach at the duchess and the baby. Amidst the onslaught of fire irons, saucepans, plates, and dishes, the duchess paid no heed, and the baby's howls continued making it impossible to discern whether the projectiles affected it. Alice, horrified, cried out, Oh, please mind what you're doing, fearing for the baby's well-being. Ignoring the chaos, the Duchess remarked in a hoarse growl, If everybody minded their own business, the world would go round a deal faster than it does, which would not be an advantage. Unfazed by Alice's attempt to discuss the rotation of the earth, the Duchess, in a rather ominous tone, suggested, chop off her head. Despite Alice's apprehensive glance at the cook, who seemed engrossed in stirring the soup, the Duchess continued her disjointed conversation. Alice attempted to clarify her understanding of time, mentioning the 24-hour day and the potential chaos if the earth turned faster. Uninterested, the Duchess dismissed Alice's remarks, claiming she couldn't abide figures. Unperturbed, the Duchess resumed singing a peculiar lullaby to the baby, accompanied by the cook and the baby's chorus of Zwau, 
wow, wow. As the Duchess hastily departed to play croquet with the Queen, the cook threw a frying pan after her, narrowly missing. Alice, now holding the oddly shaped baby, considered the possibility of taking it away to prevent harm. Voicing her concerns aloud, she received a grunting response from the baby. Worried about its well-being, Alice inspected its face, noticing a peculiar turn-up nose and tiny eyes more suited for an older creature. Despite her apprehension, she decided to nurse the baby in a particular manner to prevent it from undoing itself. Concerned for the baby's safety, Alice carried it into the open air, realizing she couldn't leave it behind to face a likely grim fate. The baby grunted in reply, having ceased sneezing. Trying to correct its improper expression, Alice faced resistance, but the baby's unusual appearance made her uneasy. Suddenly, she observed that the baby had transformed into a pig, confirming her decision not to carry it further. Relieved, Alice let the pig trot away into the woods, contemplating its potentially unsightly appearance as a child. With thoughts of peculiar transformations lingering, Alice found herself startled by the Cheshire cat, perched on a nearby tree branch. The cat, grinning, engaged in a conversation with Alice, asking about the fate of the baby, which Alice revealed had turned into a pig. The cat, nonchalant about the transformations, vanished again, leaving Alice to continue her journey towards the March Hare's house, pondering the peculiar happenings in this curious world. Chapter 7 A Mad Tea Party Beneath the sprawling branches of a tree, right in front of the house, a table was arranged for a peculiar tea party. The March Hare and the Hatter were engaged in sipping tea, with a dozing Dormouse seated between them. In an odd twist, the Dormouse served as an unwitting cushion, enduring the discomfort of having the other two use it as an armrest causing Alice to ponder on its obliviousness to the situation. The table, though substantial, was crammed with the trio positioned tightly in one corner. As Alice approached, their outcry of no room. No room echoed through the air. Indignant, Alice retorted that there was, in fact, plenty of room, promptly settling into a spacious armchair at one end of the table. The March Hare, adopting an encouraging tone, proposed, have some wine. However, as Alice surveyed the table, she found only tea, leading to her observation that there was no wine. The March Hare casually admitted the absence of wine, sparking Alice's ire. She chastised him for the discourteous offer, to which the March Hare countered by reproaching her for sitting without an invitation. Claiming ignorance of the table's ownership, Alice argued that it seemed set for more than three. The Hatter, after scrutinizing Alice with curiosity, broke the silence with a seemingly unrelated question, why is a raven like a writing desk? This sparked Alice's enthusiasm for riddles, and she confidently declared her ability to guess the answer. However, the ensuing exchange delved into the eccentricities of language, with the Hatter and March Hare presenting nonsensical statements. The Dormouse, seemingly talking in its sleep, added further absurdity to the conversation. Despite Alice's efforts to comprehend, the discussion concluded abruptly, leaving the party in momentary silence. The Hatter, diverting the conversation, inquired about the date, revealing a watch he nervously fiddled with. Alice provided the incorrect date, prompting the Hatter to blame Butter for the watch's dysfunction. 
The March Hare countered that it was the best butter, attributing any issues to stray crumbs. The Hatter, dissatisfied, blamed the March Hare for carelessly mixing butter and bread with a knife. As the tea party continued, Alice found herself increasingly bewildered by the seemingly meaningless banter. The Hatter's mention of perpetual tea time and the constant rotation of seats further perplexed her. The Hatter recounted a bizarre incident involving the Queen of Hearts concert and a contentious performance of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Bat, shedding light on the Hatter's perpetual tea time fixation. Eventually, the March Hare suggested a change of subject, expressing weariness. Alice was urged to tell a story, to which she initially objected, but the Dormouse was nominated to share a tale. The Dormouse, still half asleep, recounted a peculiar story about three sisters named Elise, Lacey, and Tilly living at the bottom of a well, surviving on treacle. Confused by the absurdity of the narrative, Alice sought clarification on the concept of drawing treacle from a well. The Hatter and Dormouse responded cryptically, causing Alice's frustration to grow. Despite her efforts to understand, the Dormouse abruptly stopped, and the Hatter proposed a shift in positions. The narrative transitioned into a disjointed discussion about drawing, with the Dormouse listing items that begin with M. Alice's confusion heightened, and the Hatter and March Hare seemed disinterested. The Dormouse eventually fell asleep, prompting Alice to decide she would never return to such a nonsensical tea party. Leaving the peculiar gathering behind, Alice continued her journey through the woods. Reflecting on the absurdity of the tea party, she declared it the stupidest she had ever attended. However, her attention was soon drawn to a tree with a door, and curiosity led her to open it, once again finding herself in the enigmatic Wonderland Garden. Chapter 8 The Queen's Croquet Ground Near the garden entrance, a large rose tree with white roses caught Alice's attention. However, her curiosity deepened as she observed three gardeners fervently painting the white roses red. Eager to understand, Alice approached them just as one of the gardeners, five, complained about splashing paint. A brief dispute unfolded among the gardeners, revealing their fear of the queen's wrath. The urgency increased when five spotted the queen approaching, and the three gardeners hastily prostrated themselves. The queen arrived with a procession of soldiers, courtiers, royal children, and notable guests, including the white rabbit. As they passed, the queen noticed Alice and inquired about her identity. Upon learning Alice's name, the queen questioned the three gardeners lying near the rose tree. Alice, attempting to remain neutral, claimed ignorance, prompting the queen to threaten beheading. The procession continued, leaving Alice concerned about the fate of the gardeners. Suddenly, a grinning Cheshire cat appeared, offering Alice someone to talk to. Engaging in conversation, Alice lamented the chaos of the croquet game, highlighting the lack of rules and the challenges of playing with live hedgehogs and flamingo mallets. The cat listened attentively. As the game progressed, the queen's fury escalated, demanding the beheading of players who missed their turns. Alice, feeling uneasy, noticed the queen's volatile nature and contemplated an escape. She encountered the Cheshire Cat again, who informed her that the Duchess was under sentence of execution. The queen's erratic judgments continued, leading to a dispute with the cat. The king attempted to mediate, but the queen's solution was consistently off with their heads. 
Tensions rose as Alice tried to navigate the chaotic game, with the Queen's frequent outbursts creating an unsettling atmosphere. As the Queen called for the removal of the cat, Alice decided to return to the croquet ground to assess the situation. There, she encountered a fight between hedgehogs but found her flamingo across the garden. As she retrieved the flamingo, the cat's head disappeared, and Alice resumed her conversation with it. Upon returning to the croquet ground, Alice found a heated argument between the executioner, the king, and the queen. They sought her judgment on the question of beheading without a body. The cats had reappeared briefly, and Alice suggested consulting the duchess. The queen ordered the executioner to fetch the duchess, and the cats had vanished. During the commotion, the players resumed the croquet game, and Alice engaged in conversation with her enigmatic friend once more. The queen, now agitated, demanded the immediate presence of the duchess. The executioner hurried to fetch her, leaving the Cheshire cat's grin as the only visible trace. As they awaited the duchess, a crowd gathered around, with the executioner, the king, and the queen presenting their arguments to Alice. Each spoke simultaneously, making it challenging for Alice to discern their points. The executioner contended that beheading required a body, and he was unwilling to start such a task at his age. The king argued that anything with a head could be beheaded, dismissing the idea as nonsense. The queen, furious, threatened mass executions if the matter remained unresolved. Alice, feeling the weight of the situation, could only suggest consulting the duchess, who was currently in prison. The queen instructed the executioner to fetch the duchess immediately. The Cheshire cat's head reappeared briefly, and then it vanished as the executioner hurried off. As the king and the executioner frantically searched for the cat's head, the rest of the party returned to the croquet game. Alice, uncertain of the outcome, observed the ongoing chaos, wondering what would happen next in this curious land. Chapter 9 The Mock Turtle's Story The Duchess and Alice walked together, the Duchess expressing joy at seeing Alice again. Alice was relieved to find the Duchess in a pleasant mood, speculating that perhaps it was the absence of Pepper that had previously made her irritable. As they strolled, Alice entertained thoughts of her future as a Duchess, resolving not to have Pepper in her kitchen. Lost in her musings about the effects of various ingredients on temperaments, Alice was startled when the Duchess, noticing her silence, remarked that Alice seemed absorbed in thought. The Duchess asserted that everything had a moral if one could find it, and she drew closer to Alice as she spoke. Despite finding the Duchess rather ugly and her chin uncomfortably sharp, Alice refrained from being rude. Trying to continue the conversation, Alice mentioned that the croquet game seemed to be going better. The Duchess agreed and, attributing it to love, uttered the phrase, "'Tis love that makes the world go round." Alice, recalling another viewpoint, whispered that some believe it's accomplished by everyone minding their own business. The Duchess dismissed this, asserting that birds of a feather flock together, linking it to mustard, which isn't a bird but a mineral. Alice, puzzled, questioned the connection, and the Duchess explained that there was a large mustard mine nearby, emphasizing, the more there is of mine, the less there is of yours. Alice, now more confused, suggested that mustard was a vegetable. The Duchess agreed, seemingly ready to concur with anything Alice said. The Duchess continued her moralizing, 
advising Alice to be what she seemed to be or, more simply, never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. Struggling to comprehend, Alice politely requested a written explanation. The Duchess claimed she could say even more if she chose, but generously gifted Alice everything she had said so far. Despite finding it a cheap present, Alice kept her thoughts to herself. Suddenly, the Queen appeared, furious, and demanded the Duchess's presence. The Duchess swiftly made her choice, and the Queen ordered everyone to resume the game. The other guests, who had sought shade in the queen's absence, returned in haste, fearful for their lives. The queen continued her harsh orders, and Alice, too frightened to object, followed her back to the croquet ground. As the game resumed, the queen quarreled incessantly, condemning players left and right. The soldiers, who acted as arches, had to abandon their positions to execute the condemned. The chaotic game resulted in the removal of all arches, leaving only the king, queen, and Alice free. The queen, out of breath, noticed Alice and inquired if she had seen the mock turtle. No, replied Alice, prompting the queen to instruct the griffin to take Alice to see the mock turtle and hear its history. The queen departed, leaving Alice alone with the griffin. The griffin, having chuckled at the queen's threats, led Alice to where the mock turtle sat, looking sorrowful on a ledge. Curious about the mock turtle's sorrow, Alice asked the griffin. In familiar words, the griffin conveyed that it was all the mock turtle's fancy, he had no real sorrow. The mock turtle began telling his history, claiming he was once a real turtle and attended school in the sea, under the tutelage of an old turtle called a tortoise. When Alice questioned why they called him a tortoise, if he wasn't one, the mock turtle replied indignantly. The griffin added its agreement, and both creatures critiqued Alice's question. The mock turtle continued his story describing the subjects they learned, including drawling, stretching, and fainting in coils. Amused by the concept of uglification, Alice inquired further. The griffin expressed astonishment at her lack of knowledge, explaining that uglification was the opposite of beautification. The mock turtle shared that, in their school, they also learned mystery, ancient and modern, with geography, along with drawing from an old Congo reel. Alice questioned the mock turtle about extra subjects, leading to discussions of extras, such as mystery, ancient and modern, geography, mystery, ancient and modern again, in case they hadn't learned enough the first time, and drawing. The mock turtle mentioned the classics master, an old crab but confessed to never attending his lessons. As the mock turtle recounted their ten-hour school days, decreasing day by day, Alice realized why they were called lessons. The queen's shouts interrupted the mock turtle's story, reminding Alice that she was still in the queen's domain. The queen, back from attending her ordered executions, confronted the duchess and Alice, demanding the Duchess's choice. The Duchess swiftly made her choice, and the Queen ordered the game to continue. The Queen's harsh directives resumed, and Alice, still frightened, followed her back to the croquet ground. As the game progressed, the Queen incessantly condemned players, and Alice, feeling uneasy about the numerous executions, wondered about her fate. Amid the chaos, Alice noticed a peculiar appearance in the air, a grin. It turned out to be the Cheshire Cat, and Alice was relieved to have someone to talk to. 
The Cheshire Cat engaged Alice in conversation, and they discussed the unfairness of the game and the Queen's temperament. The Queen, overhearing, demanded the removal of the cat. The King eagerly volunteered to fetch the executioner, but the Cheshire Cats had disappeared before the executioner could arrive. With the cat gone, the king and the executioner searched for it, while Alice observed the ongoing croquet game. Chapter 10 The Lobster Quadrille The Mock Turtle sighed deeply, wiping his eyes with one flapper. He attempted to speak, but sobs choked his voice momentarily. Like having a bone in his throat, commented the griffin, vigorously shaking and punching the mock turtle's back. After a while, the mock turtle regained his composure and continued with tears streaming down his cheeks. You may not have experienced life under the sea, Alice admitted. I haven't, responded Alice. Perhaps you've never encountered a lobster. Alice was about to confess that she had once tasted one but quickly corrected herself, saying, No, never. In that case, the griffin interjected, You have no idea how delightful a lobster quadrille is. Absolutely not, agreed Alice. What kind of dance is it? You first form a line along the seashore, two lines, corrected the mock turtle, naming various sea creatures. Then, after clearing the jellyfish away, which usually takes some time, the griffin interrupted, you advance twice, each with a lobster as a partner. Advance twice, set to partners, change lobsters, and retire in the same order, continued the griffin. Then, you throw the lobsters, shouted the griffin, making a bound into the air. Swim after them, screamed the griffin, and the mock turtle capered wildly about, adding, turn a somersault in the sea. Change lobsters again. Yell at the top of your voice, back to the land again, concluded the griffin. The mock turtle suddenly dropped his voice. And that's all the first figure. The two creatures, who had been jumping about wildly, sat down very sadly and quietly, looking at Alice. It must be a very pretty dance, Alice timidly remarked. Would you like to see a little of it? asked the mock turtle. Very much indeed, replied Alice. Come, let's try the first figure, suggested the mock turtle to the griffin. We can do without lobsters, you know. Oh, you sing, said the griffin. I've forgotten the words. They solemnly danced around Alice, occasionally treading on her toes, while the mock turtle sang a curious song about the whiting. Alice felt glad when the dance was over and expressed her liking for the song. Tell me about the whiting, Alice requested. The whiting, said the mock turtle, does the boots and the shoes under the sea. Does the boots and the shoes, repeated Alice in wonder. What are your shoes done with? They are done with a whiting, the griffin explained. And what are they made of? inquired Alice. Sauls and Neils, of course, replied the griffin impatiently. Any shrimp could have told you that. Alice was puzzled but changed the subject. The mock turtle, however, persisted in discussing the whiting's toes and its dance with lobsters. I'd have said to the porpoise, keep back, please. We don't want you with us, Alice suggested. No wise fish would go anywhere without a porpoise, asserted the mock turtle. Wouldn't it really? asked Alice in surprise. Of course not, replied the mock turtle. 
why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I should say, with what purpose? Don't you mean a purpose? corrected Alice. I mean what I say, said the mock turtle in an offended tone. The griffin urged, come, let's hear some of your adventures. Alice hesitated but then began recounting her adventures from the time she first saw the white rabbit. The griffin impatiently interrupted, no, no, the adventures first. Explanations take such a dreadful time. So, Alice continued with her adventures, gaining courage as she spoke. When she reached the part about repeating you are old, Father William, the mock turtle found it very curious. The griffin agreed, and Alice continued, her words coming out very queer indeed. Shall we try another figure of the lobster quadrille? suggested the griffin. Alice eagerly replied, Oh, a song, please, if the mock turtle would be so kind. The mock turtle sighed deeply and began singing a song about turtle soup. The griffin, not very pleased, urged the mock turtle to sing again. As they began to sing, a distant cry announced the beginning of a trial. What trial is it? Alice asked, panting as they ran. Come on, was the griffin's only response as they ran faster, and carried by the breeze, the melancholy words of the mock turtle's song faded into the distance. Chapter 11 Who Stole the Tarts the king and queen of hearts occupied their majestic thrones as the assembly gathered around them. A diverse crowd, including various birds, beasts, and the entire deck of cards, surrounded the regal couple. The knave stood before them, shackled and guarded by soldiers on either side. Close to the king, the white rabbit held a trumpet in one hand and a parchment scroll in the other. In the center of the court, a table displayed a tempting dish of tarts that drew Alice's hungry gaze. Impatient for the trial to commence, Alice wished for the proceedings to conclude swiftly so that refreshments could be served. However, the trial showed no signs of starting soon. To pass the time, Alice observed the surroundings, finding herself in a court of justice for the first time. While unfamiliar with the setting, she recognized elements from her readings. Identifying the judge by his grand wig, Alice soon realized it was the king himself, wearing his crown atop the wig. Despite his discomfort, he persisted with the unconventional combination. The jury box, housing twelve creatures that included both animals and birds, intrigued Alice. She pondered whether they were indeed jurors, a term she felt proud to understand, having read about it in books. Observing the jurors diligently writing on slates, Alice questioned the griffin about their activities. The griffin explained that they were recording their names fearing forgetfulness before the trial's end. Amused, Alice commented on their seemingly pointless task, but her words were cut short by the white rabbit's cry for silence. As the king donned his spectacles to identify the speaker, Alice, from her vantage point, noticed the jurors scribbling seemingly absurd things on their slates. The trial continued with the absurdity as one juror's squeaky pencil prompted Alice to swiftly snatch it away. This left poor Bill the lizard puzzled, relying on a single finger to write for the rest of the day. Amidst the chaos, the king requested the herald to read the accusation. The white rabbit blew three trumpet blasts and unfolded the parchment scroll. Reading aloud, he accused the Queen of Hearts of making tarts, the Knave of Hearts of stealing them, 
and called upon the jury to consider the verdict. Interrupting, the rabbit declared there was much more to come before the verdict. The king then summoned the first witness, who happened to be the hatter. Carrying a teacup and bread and butter, the hatter apologized for bringing them into court, claiming he hadn't finished his tea when summoned. The king, unimpressed, inquired about the commencement date, leading to a comical exchange of dates and confusion. Ordered to remove his hat, the hatter protested, revealing it was not stolen but kept for selling purposes. The queen, scrutinizing the hatter, raised her spectacles. The hatter, feeling uneasy, began providing his testimony, but Alice's growth distracted her. As the court fell into disarray, Alice experienced a curious sensation of growing larger. Unaware of the reason, she decided to stay put. The dormouse complained about Alice's size, prompting her to defend herself. Meanwhile, the trial continued with the Hatter's testimony. His rambling included details about tea, bread, and butter, leaving Alice intrigued but confused. Chapter 12 Alice's Evidence Here, cried Alice, completely forgetting the consequences of her newfound size. She jumped up in a hurry, causing her skirt to tip over the jury box, sending the jurors sprawling onto the heads of the crowd below. It was a chaotic scene reminiscent of a goldfish globe she had accidentally upset in the previous week. Oh, I beg your pardon, exclaimed Alice in great dismay as she began picking up the jurors. The memory of the goldfish incident had left her with the notion that they must be collected immediately to avoid any harm. The trial cannot proceed until all the jurymen are back in their proper places, declared the king with a grave voice. All, he repeated emphatically, casting a hard look at Alice. She glanced at the jury box and realized, in her haste, she had placed the lizard head downwards, causing it to wave its tail helplessly. Quickly correcting her mistake, Alice couldn't help thinking, not that it signifies much. I should think it would be quite as much use in the trial one way up as the other. Once the jurors were back in their proper places and order was restored, they diligently started writing out a history of the accident. The lizard, still overwhelmed, sat with its mouth open, making no attempt to contribute to the record. The king turned his attention back to Alice, inquiring about her knowledge of the events. Nothing, said Alice. Nothing whatever, persisted the king, to which Alice replied, nothing whatever. That's very important. The king, turning to the jury, commanded them to note that Alice didn't believe there was any meaning in it. The jury, obediently, recorded her disbelief. However, none of them attempted to explain the paper. If there's no meaning in it, that saves a world of trouble. You know, as we needn't try to find any, mused the king, though uncertainty lingered in his voice. Alice couldn't resist interjecting, offering a reward of sixpence to anyone who could explain the verses. Dismissing the possibility of any meaning, the jury seemed content to record Alice's skepticism. The king, unfazed, continued muttering over the verses to himself. We know it to be true, he mumbled, causing Alice to recall the events involving the tarts. However, her attention was caught by the continuation of the verses, suggesting the return of the tarts to the king. Interrupting, Alice pointed to the tarts on the table, asserting, there they are. The king, seemingly satisfied, proceeded to analyze the verses further. 
A pun caught his attention, leading to a momentary silence before he declared it as such. The court erupted in laughter. Let the jury consider their verdict, repeated the king for what felt like the twentieth time. The queen, however, insisted on the sentence first, verdict afterwards. Alice, growing bolder, proclaimed, stuff and nonsense, infuriating the queen. Off with her head, the queen shouted, but Alice, now realizing her full size, stood undeterred. You're nothing but a pack of cards, she boldly declared. In response, the entire deck of cards ascended into the air and descended upon her. Alice let out a small scream of fright and anger, attempting to fend them off. The world around her blurred, and she found herself lying on the river bank with her sister gently brushing away fallen leaves from her face. Wake up, Alice dear, said her sister. What a long sleep you've had. As Alice opened her eyes, she couldn't help but recount the curious dream she had just experienced. Her sister listened attentively, offering a comforting kiss, and then suggested Alice run for tea as it was getting late. Reflecting on the dream, Alice sprinted off, contemplating the wondrous adventures she had just recounted. Meanwhile, her sister remained seated, watching the setting sun, her thoughts drifting into a dream of her own. In her dream, she envisioned Alice as a grown woman, retaining the simplicity and love of her childhood. Imagining Alice sharing enchanting tales with her own children, the sister found solace in the memory of their happy summer days. And so, as the day drew to a close, Alice's fantastical journey left a lasting imprint on both her and her sister, carrying the magic of Wonderland into the realm of dreams. That's the end of today's story, I hope you'll listen to this and fall into a deep sleep. If you enjoyed tonight's story, please like, subscribe and share this for us before you go to bed. Sleep tight, dream big, and may your night be filled with the most sweet dreams. Good night, my friends.